Please welcome to the stage, Chris Cochran. I want to do something real quick. So I want you to imagine for a second that maybe there's a colleague, they're not quite a friend, they're not quite an enemy, but they run an MSP. And you see a social post from them, and I want you to take in what they're saying and really understand how you feel about each and every one of these things. Oh, yeah. All right, so number one, oh, there's a thing up there. No thanks, Zoom. <laughs> Let's close this bad boy up. All right, so quote number one. Winning MSP of the Year award is a testament to our unparalleled excellence, industry dominance. No one else comes close to matching our level of innovation and service. Digest that, understand how you feel. Let's go to another one. Somehow, despite our numerous blunders and mishaps, we've managed to snag the MSP of the Year award. We're just as surprised as somebody else. <laughs> and then number three. Winning the MSP of the Year award is a remarkable achievement that wouldn't have been possible without the hard work and dedication of our entire team. This victory belongs to every member of our organization and our amazing clients who believe in us. Now let's bring them all back up here. Think about how you felt about each and every one of those. And then I'm going to say each number, and I want you to raise your hand if that number resonates the most with you. No wrong answers. Raise your hand if quote number one resonates with you the most. I don't see any hands. All right. What about number two? Raise your hand if quote number two resonates with you the most. <laughs> a few? A few? All right. What about number three? Which one reson does that resonate with you? A lot more hands went up. Now, why is that? Let's talk about why that is for a second. Because there is a dichotomy when it comes to celebration. So one of my favorite quotes from Bruce Lee, if I tell you I'm good, you'll probably think I'm boasting, but if I tell you I'm no good, you'll know I'm lying. That's the dichotomy of celebrating yourself, about talking about your achievements. Because no one likes someone who's braggadocious, always showing that they're better than someone else, but then also kind of playing it low key, almost like just kind of waving it off, that isn't exactly the best thing either. Now, there is something to be said about brand, and I'll talk about that in a second. You could have a braggadocious brand, and that's just who you are. You could have that sort of, you know, I, hey, I just want to deflect all the attention away from myself. That's another way you could do brand. But for the majority of folks, there is a specific balance. There's a, a sweet spot, a Goldilocks zone for talking about your wins and celebration. So a little bit about me, my name is Chris Cochran. I started as a cybersecurity practitioner and leader, and now I do marketing. I do marketing for a company, uh, AKA Identity, where we uh, do workforce identity resolution. Uh, I also do uh, marketing strategy on the side for small companies. But I started as a practitioner and I found a niche in storytelling. Uh, I started in the United States Marine Corps. I was at the National Security Agency doing technical intelligence. Uh, I've gone on to do pretty cool things in security at Mandiant, United Technologies, and uh, even leading threat intelligence at Netflix. Uh, I made a pivot uh, a little while ago uh, to marketing. I've worked at companies like Exonius, uh, Crowd Favorite, Huntress, uh, Hacker Valley Media, where I was the co-founder and CEO for five years. And uh, like I said, now I'm doing uh, AKI Identity. But we're going to talk about the subtle art of celebration. Because I've done a lot of storytelling, whether you're talking about podcasts, videos, I've written a graphic novel. So I've told several stories throughout my entire career. And I've been able to share a lot of those things on social media. So if anybody here follows me on LinkedIn, you understand I'm very talkative on LinkedIn. But if you notice one thing about when I speak on LinkedIn, it's very rarely just about myself and focused on my own personal wins. So we're going to talk about today why it is important to celebrate our wins. Because one of the worst pieces of advice I've ever gotten was to, if you do something great, don't tell anyone about it. 
they never met anyone who has done CrossFit or veganism, so that is one of those things that you will never not hear anything about. We're going to talk a little bit about social neuroscience. We're going to get a little geeky for a second and talk about the four types of social interaction. We're going to talk about my favorite topic, which is story. How do you tell stories? What is a framework for storytelling that we could leverage when we're talking about sales, when we're talking about marketing, when we're just talking about having communication with people out there in the world? And then we're going to wrap everything up with a very quick cheat sheet that you can put in your pocket and take home and take to your businesses the next day. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right, let's do it. So why celebrate? Why even celebrate? If, if someone told me, hey, don't talk about your wins, uh, they might be coming from a place of like, hey, don't be braggadocious. Don't try to make people feel they're less than. Don't try to make yourself seem better than anyone else. So how do we do this the right way? Celebration, we use that to orient ourselves to our environment. Right? Because we're in a competitive environment as MSPs, we, we have to show that we have some prowess in the thing that we're doing, but we want to build that trust and credibility with the folks that we support. Because if people don't know that we know what we're talking about, well, they're probably not going to do business with us. I mean, we've all seen snake oil, we've seen advertisements for products we know that don't work, we've seen people talk about things that they can't do. But in order to show that, hey, we've been able to successfully do something, we've made an impact, whether that's a uh, industry award or maybe it's a, uh, a great feat on the security or IT side of the house, maybe we came up with something completely new and we want to share this story. But building that trust and credibility is going to help us secure clients, keep our clients. And one of the other things I want to mention is if, who here is an MSP that has uh, more than one member? Raise your hand. So quite a few. So sometimes you'll get these, these founders, because I speak to founders all the time, and what they'll say is like, oh, I don't want to talk about what I'm doing because I don't want people to think I'm boasting. You don't have to boast about yourself, but what about your team? Because your team is working really, really hard to help support your vision, help support your customers, and bring your company to that next level. So whenever you talk about your own organization, you talk about your team members, this is something that they're not going to forget. Because it's easy to get the, the kudos, it's uh, easy to get the awards as the leader of an organization. But your team probably doesn't get as much accolades as they deserve. So thinking about it from that context. If you're ever thinking about something great that the team did, don't think about it from your personal pers perspective. Think about it from the perspective of your team members. How can you shine the light on them and make them better? I talked briefly about attracting potential clients and retaining current ones. People love to be a part of a winning team. They want to know that they are with, with the right folks. If you had a choice to hang out with uh, the number one ranked fighter in the world or the 100,000th without any other information, you're probably going to want to hang out with a champion, right? Because you want to be with a winner. And that's not anything negative, but that's just who we are as humans. What is one thing that I didn't put up here on why celebrate? Anybody? It, it, yeah, it feels good, self-esteem, putting others down. It, we took that egocentric view of celebration away from ourselves. Because if we're just talking about I, me, my, ugh, I, just, I get the ick just even thinking about that stuff. But if you start to incorporate other people, and we're going to talk about these social interactions here in a second, but if you talk about other people bringing people into that story and not making it all the, just the me show, I hate when people think that whenever I post anything, it's the Chris Cochran show. I genuinely hate it. I've had many people think, oh, you love being in the limelight. I don't. Believe it or not, I'm an introvert. I am completely complicit, chilling up in my room watching Game of Thrones. I'll do that all day. I don't need to be up on stage. I don't need to be mixing and mingling with people all the time. I love to shine a light on other people. That's why I've begun to move more into the production side and director side of all my content. So when I'm writing screenplays, I'm not writing screenplays for me to be the, the actor. I'm writing the screenplay for other folks to act and them have the limelight, not myself. So think about that the next time you want to choose to celebrate something with your team. So let's talk about the four social interactions. I'll tell you where this came from. I, I'm obsessed with storytelling. I'm obsessed with social interactions. And I started to think, I was like, what, if I, what is the study for attention? 
And not attention from like focus perspective like ADHD, but attention from, as we're children, we need attention to develop and live and thrive. When you get too much attention as a celebrity that does something to you mentally, and I'm like, there's, there's something here. And I talked to several psychologists and they couldn't give me an exact science as to what is that science that has to do with attention, has to do with social interaction. And so I kept looking, I kept looking, and one day I was in the shower where all the great ideas of the world come from. And I was like, oh, if I was gonna do studies, different studies for this science that I might be creating right here in my mind, these are the studies that I would do. And I was like, oh, this is brilliant. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna take all these ideas for studies I have, I'm gonna drop it in a chat GPT and see if he can tell me what that study is. And sure enough, it did. I was really hoping I created a new science, and I'm really, I'm really sore about that, but the fact of the matter is it's about uh, search, social neuroscience. And so I immediately bought the top five books on social neuroscience in the world. They're very expensive, I don't recommend it. Uh, but the first one I read told me about, in the very first page, told me about the four social interactions that people go through. So the first one is selfish. Right, so I win, you lose. This is where a lot of uh, sales, this is where a lot of marketing comes from. It comes from this place of egotistical self-centeredness. It comes from, I gotta hit my quota, I don't care if you need my product or not, I'm trying to sell you, right? But then you get to something that's altruistic. You win, I lose. And that's not always bad, right? You might be giving something to someone, you might be donating money, you might be volunteering your time, well, you get some satisfaction from it, that direct transaction is more of a giving motion. Spiteful, look, we're, go we're going down together. I'm going to burn your ships while I burn my ship with it. But then there's the last one, which is mutually beneficial. Mutually beneficial. This just simple concept of being mutually beneficial changed the way I do sales, it changed the way I do marketing, it changed the way I do content, it changes the way I interact with people. Because if you can find this mutually beneficial area, it's positive for everybody. It's not self-serving, you're not being a martyr, you're somewhere in the middle where you're able to support someone else while you're gaining as well. Does anybody know about JFK and the PT-109? Couple folks. So this was super interesting. Uh, I learned this pretty recently. So JFK, uh, for those of you who didn't know, uh, was in the military, and he was a lieutenant. And he was in a patrol boat, it was late at night, like 2.30 in the morning, and a Japanese vessel, not on purpose, inadvertently hit his little boat. It's like an 80-foot boat, it's really small. And he had a crew of folks that were on the boat with him, and it completely dismantled this boat. Now, he went into like a heroic action. He started barking orders, he started telling people what to do, how to survive, uh, he started getting his people together. While he was on this water, there was fuel that was on fire. So some of his folks were burning, some, one of his guys was badly burnt, and so he had to make a decision, what are we gonna do to survive? Because we're in the middle of nowhere. They figured out that they were about three and a half miles away from land. So he put a strap in his mouth that was connected to the guy that was badly burnt, and they swam three and a half miles and he got his team to safety and ended up getting rescued. Now, I don't know about you, but if I, that was my story, I'd be telling everybody, but like, look, let me tell you about the time, when it, because that is such a heroic story. But let me tell you what JFK did instead. So when he was go, uh, running for president, he could have went up on stage, he could have continued to talk about how he did this, I did that, I was able to save these folks, but that's not what he did. What he did is he went up and he would always speak about the men that were on that boat with him. He would talk about how he was able to learn from them about leadership. He was able to learn from them about heroism. Now, you can see how that's much more palatable than saying, I, me, my, right? Can you see that? So that's something that I want you to take away from this mutually beneficial situation. Let's talk about story for a little bit. And I do think it's a lost art. It's one of those things that we started to do really, really early on in our existence. And we do it today to a degree. I mean, there's TikToks and there's Instagrams and things like that. But I think the art of storytelling is something that I think we all have in ourselves, but we don't exercise it as much as we should. And so the more we start to study and we start to practice the art of storytelling, the better we're gonna be at sales, the better we're gonna be at marketing, the better we're just gonna be as people in general. Let me tell you a quick story 
about the art of storytelling and how it can make an impact. I was in, obviously I was in the Marine Corps and I was overseas uh, in Iraq. And I was doing a technical intelligence and this guy, he had this idea of pulling all the folks that did my specific job into one base. So I'd travel all through the country and I've been to different fobs and he brought everyone together to do this thing. But we started to call him behind his back, we never call him to his face, Dr. No. Because he would tell us no to everything, very risk averse. He didn't want anything to go wrong. He wanted to show how his idea of bringing all those folks together to do one job would benefit the intelligence community, would benefit the, the war fighter. And so he never wanted to make a mistake. One day I had the, option, or the opportunity to go fly down with a special ops team and do a very, very special mission. And then here I am, I'm thinking, there's no way this guy's gonna let me go. There's just no way. And so I said, all right, what, what can I do? I, I, can, I can intimidate him, right? I'm a Marine, I can step up and say, hey, if you don't let me go, I'm gonna kick your butt. Oh, no, that's not gonna work. Uh, what, uh, what, I can beg, I can say, oh, please, please let me go. If you let me go, I'll, you'll be the best guy ever. Uh, that probably won't work either. What I did instead is I told a story. I said, hey, uh, Dr. No, obviously I didn't call him that. I said, hey, uh, so we have an opportunity here. There's a special mission that I am specifically selected for, and if we do this, this could be the linchpin of the success of your program. This could be it, this could be, you could prove everybody that you made the right decision by, by enabling me to do this mission. And he thought for a second, and he started to get that prideful look in his eye, and that's when I knew I had him. And so I was able, in the, under the guise of night, Special Forces team came with a Black Hawk, Black Hawk. I got loaded up, felt like I was in Call of Duty. But for those of you that don't know, uh, have never ridden in a Black Hawk, there's a, uh, a thing called a wind seat, uh, where the wind basically just blows in your face. And so I was riding for about an hour and a half with wind blowing in my face. I don't recommend it, but it's still pretty cool. So. When, we, when, when I was doing that, I started with the audience. I thought about what does he want to get out of this? A lot of times we tell our own story, we want to be the center of attention, we want to just talk about the stuff that we want to talk about. But if you're talking to a client, if you're talking to a partner, if you're talking to your C-suite, if you're talking to the board, start with the audience in mind. Think about what do they want to get out of this story? How do you put them in the driver's seat so that they understand what you're trying to do? Evoke emotion. Stories about emotion. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a presentation where they just put up data sheets and graphs and charts and had no story whatsoever and there was no emotion. It's hard to remember that stuff, right? But if you start to tie data to emotion, that's when you create memory. One of the things I used to do is I used to write for the Fed Bar Association. It was a bunch of lawyers and they wanted to understand security. So what I did was I was like, how do I get them to understand what ransomware is? What I did was I say, I want you to imagine you arrive at home after a long week at the office, you come up to your door, you put in your key, and it doesn't turn. You try it for a little bit, it doesn't work, and then you notice that there's a note on your door that says, we have taken over your house. If you want access to your house, you have to deliver bitcoins, a yada, yada, yada address, right? Because now that's a visceral reaction. You could all, in that story, feel what it would feel like to lose access to your own home. But now you understand not only what it would feel like to have that done to you, but you also understand the concept of ransomware and what that really does. So being able to evoke emotion and tie that story to that data is how you create that memory. Highlight challenges and solutions, right? A, the challenge with Dr. No, he was trying to make sure that people knew about his pro program and make sure that it was successful. So then I brought up the solution. Hey, you can, Show everyone that you made the right decision by doing this mission. And use a story formula. Now, they get really complex. I'm gonna show you a more complicated story formula, but I'm gonna give you a story formula that's much easier to remember. Anybody watch Rick and Morty? Raise your hand. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this after the talk, but if you have a more intelligent show than Rick and Morty, please let me know what that intelligent show is, because I haven't found one yet. I think is absolutely brilliant. But what Dan Harmon does, he's created a lot of shows, the story circle, right? You start with your protagonist, then you, that protagonist needs something. There's something that they're going for. 
right? They have to go on this journey. They have to cross that threshold. They have to be on this search. They have to run into all types of things. Uh, fine, they might meet a goddess or they might meet a guide or something like that to help them go through this. They have to pay a price, right? There's something that always bad ha happens. And you can kind of feel when that, that movie is starting to get on the back half of that movie. Return, right? They're coming back as the champion, as the victor, as they're coming back as the goddess, they're coming back as whatever it is. The world has changed, right? And this is the circle, uh, the story circle. Now, you could remember that and you could try to apply it, but I'll have something much more simple. So just think of it as normal, bang, new normal. Easy, right? I can remember that. So what do we say? All right, so let's go back to this Dr. No story. So Dr. No, all right, so normal is like, hey, business as usual operations. We still haven't found our niche for uh, how is this program going to be successful. The bang was the mission. We execute the mission. It's a big success. Parade, celebration, everything, right? And then that's the new normal. This program works. And this applies to anything. This applies to, hey, you customer, you need support, you need help. Bring us in. Our partnership is that bang. And the new normal is your excellence and your success, right? There's any way you could cut this sort of thing. Same thing for if you're writing a post on social media and you're celebrating your wins. So normal, hey, you know, we work really hard. We we're just doing our thing then bang, we won this award, we worked together, we uh, teamed up with another company, we executed this mission, and now we are a successful team, and it, you can see this in our accolades. But yeah, this, just take that along for yourself. So what was the bang for the matrix? Anybody? Red pill, right? Once he took the red pill, there was no going back. He had to go down this journey, and that's when he became the one. What about Oppenheimer? What was the bang there? Yeah, the opportunity to build the bomb, exactly. Some people would have said the bomb itself. Well, that's a different type of bang. But uh, <laughs> what about Iron Man? What was the bang there? When he was captured, when he built Mark I, exactly. So whenever he decided, hey, I need to build something to make me stronger, to save the world, save myself, change my reality. These are the bangs. So let's go over this cheat sheet, and then we're going to get to any questions that you might have about your stories or celebration. So celebrating a win is, is important, but include others in that celebration. If you go to my social media, try to find a post where it's just talking about me that doesn't have to do with anyone else, that doesn't call out somebody's success or someone's uh, input to something that I did. Of the four, Social interactions, use mutually beneficial as much as possible. Sure, there are going to be times when you're altruistic. I definitely wouldn't recommend being spiteful. And then if you have to use selfish, use it very sparingly. But use mutually beneficial as much as possible. You know, craft your story with the audience in mind. Think about the person that you're talking to. How do, how do you put them in the story? How do you even make them the protagonist of that story? Evoke emotion. Make that information tie to their mind through emotion. And then follow that simple story equation and make sure that, hey, there's three parts to it. There's the normal, the bang, and the new normal. So yeah, with that, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I put out stuff like this all the time. And let's uh, get to some questions. Yep. Oh, what, what was the question? Oh. Right. So orient yourself in the, the context of the team. Are you by yourself or do you have teammates? You have team? Fine. Talk about the team. Talk about how much they were able to do. Uh, talk about uh, how much impact that it's caused for the organization. 
So include yourself in the story, but show like, hey, what was the impact to the entire organization? What were other team members able to do? So say, hey, uh, Rebecca, she was able to do this. You know, she had this great idea, the X, Y, and Z, and so we executed. And then Johnny, uh, Johnny, he stood up. Uh, he, he actually worked a little bit on the weekends and ensured that we did this. And so, yeah, you know, this is, these are some of the things that I did over the quarter. And I think that I'm uh, operating on a level that's higher than my current station. So I would, I would kind of frame it just like that. What else? I love it. I love this question. So he's asking about how do you keep someone on track? When you're going down a, a certain pathway, when you're telling a story, you're trying to get to a point, but sometimes there are things on the slide that might distract folks. People might start to go down another path. All you do is you simply say like, hey, look, uh, what you're talking about right now is really, really important. And let's find another time or another meeting to talk about that. For this meeting specifically, we're trying to get down to here. That's exactly what you do. Yep, exactly. Bring it back on track. And you don't have to be a jerk about it. You don't have to be like, hey, I'm talking about this. I'm not talking about that crap. Just say, hey, that's really important. I'm glad you brought that up. But for this specific discussion, this is what we're talking about. What else? Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. I would say what I wanted you all to take away is basically that, that cheat sheet, right? So the main thing that I wanted everyone to take away is that mutually beneficial, right? Making sure that your interactions are mutually beneficial. If you've been to a trade show floor, if you've received a sales call, you've been in situations where they were selfish, right? They didn't, they didn't care about who you were. They were. You were a number. They just wanted to sell to you. They didn't uh, validate if you had a problem that they could solve. They were just thinking about their own self-interest. But if you're really focused on hey, how do I help you help me, right? If we, do that, if we do that in any of our interactions as human beings, we're going to be that much better. Then also bringing back that storytelling aspect. Like, how do we bring story back? How do we tell a story when we're putting something out? Sure, we could say, hey, we won this award, um, thanks. But what if you tell a little bit of a story? What if you talk about what your team had to do to get there? What if you talked a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced in order to have this thing become a reality? Right, so those I would say were pretty much the main things that I wanted folks to take away from this. Yeah, so when you're storytelling with customers, you, whether it's on the, the pre-sales or post-sales, on pre-sales, tell them a story of who you are and why you're there, right? Give them your origin story, like as a superhero. Tell them, hey, you know, I formed this company or I joined this company because of X, Y, and Z. This is why this particular mission matters to me. And say like, hey, this is what we've done. This is the successes we've been able to have with other customers. And this was the impact that has been created through our existing. And this is how we think that we can help you. We see that you have a problem in X, Y, and Z. We are able to solve that because we have these capabilities, we have these people, we have this technology that we think is gonna help you operate better, enable you to innovate, and you're gonna be able to, to sing you know, all the praises you want in the, in the world based on our mutual beneficial relationship. And then on the post-sale side, I want you to think about, hey, keep track of those wins, right? We talk about receipts. Keep the receipts of like, times where you were able to support them, times where you were really able to show up for them uh, when they were probably in, in a really bad spot. Because sometimes we have to deal with things like uh, IR, right, incident response. Uh, Robert Coffey, he's going to talk, I think, tonight or tomorrow about his situation probably. So like really understanding, like, how did you show up for somebody when they were in need? And that will keep that relationship going. That's how you build that relationship with your client. Um, so I have a couple of and so I feel like 
Right. Right. Exactly. A simple way to put it, he, basically he summarized the talk and saying that he has a, a hard time celebrating his wins because he doesn't want to come across braggadocious. And so he's saying, hey, uh, make it, you know, divert some of that attention, be more inclusive of people when I'm talking about celebrating the wins. Yeah, think about it going from I and me to we. Right? That's one of the best ways you can look at it. How can you include someone else? Even if it's someone that wasn't uh, directly uh, uh, a part of that story. Right? I could talk about my mom and say, oh, you know, my mom taught me when I was a young man to always hold the door open for a lady. Right? I, it could be anything. You can really tie it to someone else, bring anyone else into that story just to make it so it doesn't feel so self-centered. Anyone else? All right, I appreciate it, y'all. Yeah, feel free to connect with me, and then I'll be around for the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>